Welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Lesson 37, Mark 9. Now, yesterday, it was a real hurrah message. It was like, let's go get them. Mark 8, 34, it's a pretty, pretty tough message. Kevin, if you'll go there. And here we are talking about if you really want to be a follower of Christ, these are your requirements. You got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And as we saw and studied yesterday in that wheel of death, really, or you could look at it as a wheel of life <laughs> because they gave up their life for the Lord, 12 guys lived and breathed in Mark 8, 34. That was kind of our backdrop to yesterday. This is not just a check in the box. Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. No, no, no. We're supposed to literally exemplify these different things that Jesus is, ask is asking. Excuse me. All right, here we are in Mark 9. Mark 9, verse 1 and on, really, in, in two, 2 through 13, we're going to get into the transfiguration. Remember last, last time we, we talked about that? Peter, James, and John, right? They are a part of the inner circle, okay? The inner circle got to see Jairus' daughter get healed. They got to see and be a part of the praying at the Garden of Gethsemane. Like, this is the inner circle. And now they're here at the Mount, uh, they're, they're at the transfiguration, getting to experience Moses and Elijah and Jesus. An incredible time, but because we talked on it and taught on it last time, all right, we're going to keep on moving here. So Mark 9, 14 through 29, here you have another uh, demonic interaction. Remember, Jesus clearly sent out his disciples to go preach the gospel and cast out demons. Jesus himself is doing that. Not as Satan, not as Beelzebul, because that, that wouldn't make sense. Satan can't cast out Satan, but because he has the power and authority from God, because he is God to set people free, that's exactly what he does through verses 14 through 29. Now, if you guys remember yesterday's lesson, prior to Mark 8, 34, the, the followers of Christ denying ourselves, taking up the cross and being a follower of him, you know, we saw the very first time in Mark, the prediction that Jesus was going to die. Now here we have a second prediction. I'm just going to tell you there's a total of three in the gospel of Mark. This is the second one. It took me a while to figure that one out, just so you know. So it says this in verse 30. Then they left that place and they made their way through Galilee. But he didn't anybody to know it. <laughs> it's like the secret mission again. For he was teaching his disciples and he was telling them. In other words, he had a message that he only wanted his disciples to hear. He didn't need everybody else to hear this. And this is what he wanted them to know. The Son of Man, second time, he says this, is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him and after he is killed, what's going to happen? He will come back to life. He will rise three days later. But these disciples, they didn't understand this statement and they were afraid to ask him. You know how like, you know, somebody tells you one thing and you heard it and then you, you hear it again and you're like, ah, I should have heard it the first time. I, I know he said it the second time, but I, I, there was, it was like they were afraid to get into this uh, discussion. That's the backdrop of watches of verse 33. Now, <laughs> This is really interesting to me. Remember, who was at Transfiguration, right? The Mount. Peter, James, and John, right? So this is kind of the where they're coming from. So it says, then they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, okay, we don't know if it was Peter's home. We don't know if it was maybe Jesus' house that he's quote-unquote renting. Like, it, it could just be his, his go-to headquarter house at Capernaum. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like, oh yeah, it's just... This is Jesus' headquarters here. And so as they're coming to Capernaum, okay, he's in the house. He asks them, who's he asking? He's asking those guys, hey, what, what were you arguing about on, on our way back? What were you arguing about on, on the way? And I love this because right away, this makes me think of the road to Emmaus conversation, right? Kevin, if you'll go there, Luke 24, verse 17. So it was kind of like they're not talking to Jesus, but Jesus knows they're talking. Jesus knows they're arguing. In fact, Luke 24, 17, then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? <laughs> kind of like, oh, you heard that? <laughs> you guys ever, you ever been caught like that? Like, I, what were you guys talking about? Uh, nothing, you know, kind of deal, right? So Jesus just calls them out. Peter, James, and John, what are you guys, what were you actually arguing? Now, when I say arguing, Jesus actually means there was a major problem here. They were discussing something really serious, so much so that look in verse 34. <laughs> this is awesome. He asked them, what were you arguing about? And they were silent. Maybe if we don't answer, I'm not talking, you talk. Mm, I'm not talking because on the way, they had been arguing about with one another about who was 
the greatest. Don't you love that? Oh yeah, I saw four demons come out yesterday. <laughs> I saw six. <laughs> did you see anybody come back to life? Nope, me neither. Huh. Hey, how many people did you see in Capernaum come to know the Lord? Like, how are they qualifying who's the greatest? Taylor, I got to ask you. What do you think? Well, how are they determining who's the best? Whoever was closest with him. Oh, well, that was like very spiritual. I thought maybe you were going to come up with something like Taylor-esque. I mean, like my cousins and I, I'm the favorite cousin, <laughs> but I spend the most time with my grandma, so that's why. It's, it's, like, it's like sometimes we're like, where did that come from? Taylor, that was genius. When you spend the most time, Peter, you would think, would be that guy, right? But Peter, James, and John, they're all talking about like, hey, th this, I, I think it's me. No, I think it's me. They're missing the whole point of humility. In fact, Kevin, Matthew 5, verse 3, remember the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 3, it talks about, hey, oh, by the way, this is what I'm after. Not, not the greatest, but how it says the, the poor in spirit are blessed. How blessed are those who are poor in spirit. For the kingdom of heaven is, is theirs. If I was Jesus, I'd be like, oh, guys. You're supposed to be my favorite. <laughs> and you're arguing about who is the, the greatest? Verse 35, it says this. So sitting down, and you know how this works, right? Whenever he wants to communicate more, he not only communicates just to the three, but then he gets to the 12. And then it says he gets everybody else. So here it says he called the 12 and he said to them, <laughs> if anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of, of all. <sighs> What does that mean? You know, does that mean like if I'm at a roller coaster line and like I got to go to the back of the line? I don't know. What does that mean to you, Kevin? I think it's a, it means a, a sense of humility, uh, putting others before yourself. Yeah. So this whole following of Christ, Mark 8, 34, denying yourselves, taking up your cross and following Christ. Now he's saying, and oh, by the way, <laughs> I need you to be a servant in this whole process. Jeff, you want to add anything? I, I think in a lot of ways he's trying to teach them counterculture, you know, because I think a lot of these guys, what they're trying to do is they're trying to jockey for position and create stature for themselves. And Jesus is saying, hey, guys, listen, it's that's not what this is about. It's actually the opposite. Yeah, that's good. You know, <laughs> that's, that's really powerful. Um, Nelson's commentator, in there, there's a guy, a person named Sveet, right? This commentator says this, the spirit of service, goes exactly with what you said, Jeff, is the passport to eminence in the kingdom of God, for it is the spirit of the master who himself becomes servant of all. If you want to gain access to the kingdom of God, if you want to gain access to prominence, guess what you do? You serve. In America, you know, when I was in the sports industry for a couple seasons, uh, short-lived time in my life, it was all about climbing the ladder as fast as I can. And who do you know? And how can I move from this place to this place? And it, it was a game. And it's a fun game because when you start moving and connecting the dots and then, and then all of a sudden you're moving in a fast pace, guess what happens? The money comes in. The fame comes in. Ownership comes in. All of this begins to come, and Jesus just says, eh, that's not how I live. Did you notice how uh, I didn't come in on, on a horse? I came in on a, on a donkey. I'm going to be coming in on a horse down the road in Revelation, but how I'm going to do things is the complete opposite of culture. And I think to me, as, as let's just write these up again if you can. You know, as a, as a follower of Christ... You know, first of all, what is it, Kevin? Do you remember our first one? Deny yourself. Second one, Jeff, Taylor. Pick up your cross. Take up your cross. Third one, Tom, do you remember that one? No. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good job. I got it. Follow Jesus. <laughs> I love the honesty. Mm, no. <laughs> okay, so these components, but I would just say, look, now watch in verse 35 of Mark 9, 35. He says, sitting down, he called the 12. If anybody wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. Look, I'm not saying this is an antidote at all, but the, ma the mentality is, is that you're last and you're the servant. Because why? What's our one word for the, the gospel of Mark? Jesus is 
our servant. So Jesus' language, that Kevin, you go to John 3, verse 30, is that he is a servant. This is, this is the lifestyle that he wants us to live. In John 3, verse 30, one of those prayers for me in my life, uh, pretty much uh, on a regular basis when speaking, when communicating, he must increase, but I must decrease. I, I love this line because do you guys know the context of this? Who's saying this? Do you guys remember? John the Baptist says he's preparing the way, right? He says, I got to get out of the way so that he can be made known. So as a follower of Christ, your whole goal is to, it, it's, <laughs> it's to keep pointing people to Jesus. So I must decrease. He must increase. <laughs> Can I just tell you, that goes against every single layer of forget Christianity, just culture. I got to make myself known. I got to get, I got to get as many followers as I can. I got to get my most albums sold. And I, I look, I get there's 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 truth to some of that. Like I get that. Like artists and worship stuff. And if you're an incredible speaker and teacher and and people are listening to you and you're pointing to Christ. I, I get that. I'm just going for the heart after this. That's all I'm going after. The heart is, it's not about you. It's about him. Imagine if nobody knew what you did, would you still do it? That's what we're getting after right here. If nobody knew what you did, would you still do it because Jesus asked you to follow him? In John 3.30, that, to me, paints an incredible picture. And Kevin, can you go to 1 Peter 5, verse 6? 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Strange enough, uh, Mark 9, verse 35, is one of the key verses in all the Gospel of Mark, but I'd actually say it's Mark 10, 45, which we'll get to tomorrow. And watch this. When you humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that He may exalt you at the proper time. Don't flip it. Don't try to exalt yourself. <laughs> It doesn't work. But when you humble yourself, God opens up the doors. You know, I, I've been blown away at Time Revive at our team in, in different cities and different states and how they're looking to share the gospel. But as they continue just to keep being faithful to what's in front of them, God just, He opens up doors in Texas. He opens up doors in Ohio. He opens up doors in Wisconsin. And it's when you make it all about Him and not about yourselves, I really believe God honors that. I'll be honest, the way that I have seen servanthood, first and foremost, is through my dad. You know, we can laugh about my parents uh, owning an Ace Hardware in Middlebury, Indiana, just across from Jayco, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, down the road from Essen House, if you guys are remotely interested, Martin Ace Home Center. Anyway, um, you know, Ace is the place. This is where we laugh. But all I've ever known in my family is you serve the community. That's all I've ever known. They walk in the door, you serve them. You help them with paint, with plumbing, electrical, uh, with flowers, with balloons, with lumber, however I grew up. And that was my job. My job was to serve because if you wanted people to come back, it actually wasn't about the name. It actually wasn't about the price. You know what it was about? It was about the service. And then I also remember when I went to Dallas Seminary, I got to see Dr. Walt Baker, a missions professor at Dallas Seminary. Man, he, he just served and loved on me. It wasn't about him. He just loved on me. I got to see humility by putting me first and he didn't care. I mean, that's how I got to see this. And then I went to Nashville, Tennessee, and my wife and I got to go there and I got to be a part of a, a Christian musician and, and his wife. And they ministered to us for a whole year. And I saw this man who's a very well-known national singer at that time. He just humbled himself and poured into my life. He put me a priority rather than himself. And so I got to see this model from my dad and from Walt and from this Christian musician. And then, and then I went into uh, Gordon Conwell. As I'm pursuing more schooling, I got to see a guy named Robert Coleman, who, in my opinion, has a, an incredible insight on discipleship. You know, here he is pouring into different theologians worldwide, and then he makes you feel like, like you're everything. And so when you begin to see these models of serving and loving, it helps you paint a picture of who Christ is in your life. But it's crazy, you know, these guys that are going to jail, they're going to jail because they don't necessarily even have a father figure. Well, I could see why they don't know what a servant looks like if they've never seen it modeled for them before in their life. And so, I, you know, 
none of these guys, except maybe my dad, would ever listen to this message. But man, thank you. Thanks for being an incredible example of serving others well, putting them first, because to me, no, I don't do it well, and I'm, I'm learning in this process. <laughs> and no, I'm not like Moses, who Moses, didn't Moses say he was the most humblest guy of all time? And, and then he wrote it, right? I got a long ways to go, but I feel like I'm closer just because I've seen it modeled. And that's really what Jesus is saying. He just said, if anybody wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of, of all. And God will do the work in his due time. Now, this word servant, okay, it just simply means somebody who serves. In the Greek, diakonos, it describes somebody who serves, you ready? This is key, willingly. You're not doing this begrudgingly. <clears throat> You're not saying, ah, okay, I'll get the peanuts and the pretzels. Kevin doesn't do that. Kevin gets it willingly for us. You know, okay, fine, I'll order our lunch while we're recording. Ke Kevin doesn't do that. He does it willingly. That's the point of this. This is serving comes willingly and it's not forced. It's a cool picture, isn't it? It's not forced. And the craziest thing is <laughs> you can fake it. Oh, yeah, I'm a servant. You can fake it like, oh, yeah, I'm willing to do this. But God totally knows what you're talking about and what you're thinking. Think about the guys on the road. He's like, hey, I, hey guys, remember what he says? <laughs> what does it say, Kevin? It says in what, in verse 33? He says, hey, what, what were you arguing about? Like he already knows your motives. He already knows what you're talking about. And so I love this. He knows our thoughts, Psalm 139 too. So you can't fake whether or not you're a servant or not. He knows your heart motives behind this. Psalm 139 too says this, you know when I sit down and when I stand up, you understand my thoughts from far away. If you're like, dude, I don't have a servant mentality at all. It's like, God's like, I already know that. <laughs> and so I would just start praying, Lord, give me this heart to put other people first. Give me this heart, you ready for this? To understand it ain't about me and it's about him and what others think. Not think in the sense of how you do things, but who they are in their life. Kevin, can you go to 1 Chronicles 28, 9? He knows our thoughts. First Chronicles 28, 9. This is cool. As for you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. Why? For the Lord searches every heart and understands the intention of every thought. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. You know what that really means? He knows the motives behind everything you do. Are you doing the motives because you want to, quote unquote, be great like Peter, James, and John? Or are you doing the motives because Scripture says in Mark 9, 35, he's asking us to serve and serve well. So here's my question. This is real practical, okay? We're going to spend the rest of the time doing this. What on earth are characteristics of a servant? What are some qualifiers? You'd be like, oh, that would be a good sign if I saw that in Taylor. Oh, that would be a good sign if I saw this in Jeff. Like, what would be characteristics of you saying, okay, I'm getting closer to Mark 9, 35 than I thought, okay? So we're going to write down seven things, depending on our time if we can. Number one, a servant, okay, is humble. When's the last time you've seen an arrogant, an arrogant servant? <laughs> it, it just doesn't seem to work for me. In Philippians 2, 3 through 8, okay, this is really cool. If there's anybody that could have played the arrogant card, it would be Jesus. But he doesn't. It says, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. As a servant, you're constantly putting yourself before. As kids, do you know how hard this is to get my four kids to have this perspective right here? I I'm sorry. Your sister actually matters. <laughs> I'm sorry, your little brother, you need to put him first. But scripture says, no, no, you consider others more important than yourselves. When you have this mentality, you're that much closer to experiencing Mark 9, 35. Mm, that's a hard one. All right, let's keep going. There's a lot more with Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Uh, here's a really cool one for me. A servant prepares. Kevin, can you go to 1 Timothy 4, 7? So not only is a servant humble, but a servant prepares, okay? Watch this, in 1 Timothy 4, 7, uh, part B, okay? Rather, train yourself 
in godliness. Now watch as it says in verse 8. For the training of the body has a limited benefit. For godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And then in verse 15, if you'll go there. Verse 15 of 1 Timothy 4, uh, 15. Practice these things. Be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Okay, I want to be a servant. I want to work on this in my life. Well, first of all, pray for humility. Second of all, begin to prepare yourself. And it says in 7b and in 8, the way you do this is that you have to actually start training yourself in the area of godliness. If you're not training your area, if you're not being prepared, it's really, really hard to serve like Christ. So part of a characteristic I should see in TJ, TJ should see in me, it's humility. Jeff should see in me, oh, this guy is being prepared. He's, re he's ready to serve. That's part of being prepared for the return of Christ. So what are some characteristics? Uh, I love what, this is what Pastor Colin Smith says. Pastor Colin Smith comes up with these seven characteristics of, of a servant. Here's another one that Colin Smith says. A servant perseveres. A servant perseveres. Kevin, if you go to Luke 12, verse 35. Okay, a servant, sometimes you're going to get flack. Sometimes you're going to get grief. But it doesn't mean you actually stop. In humility, you're prepared. You must continue to work this out. Be ready for service and have your lamps lit. We know in verse 36, if you'll keep going, you must be like people waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. And in verse 37, those slaves the master will find alert when he comes will be blessed. I assure you, he'll get ready have them recline at the table, then come and serve them. Not only are you prepared, but you're willing to persevere in this process of literally waiting on the king. I love these characteristics of being humble, being prepared, and persevere, because if this becomes part of your lifestyle, this actually makes sense to you. If it doesn't, start praying that the Lord would begin to show you how you can work on these things. So what I want to do is I want to give you a fourth characteristic. I'm just writing up here right now just so you know a couple of the verses that stand out. One of the fourth, the fourth characteristic, okay, is that a servant, this is really key to me, and one that I see in these guys here in this room, a servant serves where needed. Like it really doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what it looks like. And in fact, Kevin, can you go to 1 Corinthians 9, 19? These are one of the things I see about the Time Revive team, especially as we do Revive School. It's, it's, it's always changing. <laughs> For although I am a free man and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. Lord willing, Revive School is having an impact. I mean, I love the fact that this is not just going in Indiana. I love the fact that it's not just going into Wisconsin. But man, it's going into Canada. It's going into Liberia. I love that. And it's happening because... These men and women that are a part of this whole team, they're serving wherever needed. The, the, the study guide questions. We've never written study guide questions before, but guess what? We're doing it right now. My wife's never written a daily do devotional before. She's doing it right now. And so like to me, you will see willing servants serve wherever needed. And that's an incredible characteristic that I believe shows exactly what Mark 9.35 is after. A couple other characteristics that Pastor Colin Smith says. Let's go to the fifth one. The fifth one here, it just says, a servant, okay, serves, or, this is kind of funny, or not, <laughs> I'll get to that in a second, as God directs. So if God tells you not to do that, obviously you're not going to do that, but you want to serve as God directs. Kevin, if you would, go to Romans 8, 28. Uh, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. I'll just tell you, when you've been called with a servant mentality, you just go. No questions asked. I'm in. I'll do it. I know it doesn't make sense. I'm willing to drive here. I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to study at this point in the time in the day. <laughs> Whatever it means, you're willing to do as God leads. That's kind of the beauty. And you can do this in your factory. You can do this in your insurance company. You can do this at your Ace Hardware. You can do this wherever you're at. You don't have to be in a labeled Time Revive ministry. You can do this right where you're at. A servant's characteristic is that you're willingly do, you're doing this as God leads you to. 
Okay, number six. We're getting close. We've got two more to go. And this goes back to a, being a follower of Christ, which you're going to see in number seven. A servant very clearly expects to suffer. Kevin, how does that tie into a follower of Christ? A servant expects to suffer. Well, that's right back to denying yourself and taking up the cross. Yep, Matthew 10, 24 through 25, and also we said Mark 8, was that 45? No, 35. 34, thanks. Mark 8, 34. So a servant expects to suffer in this process. And number seven, I like this one. A servant is not ashamed. Kevin, go to 2 Timothy 2.15. I'm thankful for Pastor Colin Smith just kind of writing out characteristics of what does it look like to be a servant. It's pretty cool. Be diligent to present yourself a proof to God. A worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. I mean, to me, I think of servants, I think of workers, and I think you have no reason to be ashamed. And look what this says. You're presenting yourselves approved to God and you're correctly teaching the word of truth wherever you're at. Being a servant doesn't mean you're quiet. Being a worker doesn't mean you're ashamed. It actually means you're presenting yourselves before the Lord and you're correctly teaching the word of truth. <laughs> How about that one? Like to me, these are incredible characteristics of when I see the Gospel of Mark. Now, to wrap this up with two verses in, in 36 of Mark 9, verse 36, it says this. Remember, Jesus has said, if anybody wants to be first, he must be last of all, servant of all. And he says, then he took a child. He had him stand among them, this, this little child, I don't know how old, and taking him in his arms, he said to them in verse 37, whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. And you think, why the random kid comparison? <laughs> why throw in the word child with the word servant? Because I think this is a really cool picture that this word child, this word uh, servant, it is used in the same, this word child and ser uh, servant is used in the same Aramaic, it's the same word in the Aramaic language. Child and servant is used as the same word in the Aramaic. And here's what I see in this. You must have the heart of a child in order to effectively serve others. If you welcome anybody like this little child, you'll willingly serve anybody. I think it's a cool picture and it goes back to this. There's, there's no favor, favoritism of Jairus' daughter or the woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. There's no favoritism. When you willingly put others before yourself, when you deny yourself, you take up your cross, you follow Jesus, and when you become to have this, this mentality of servant of all, <laughs> Jesus gets the glory. All right, guys, that's lesson 37, Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.